In today's tutorial, we're going to look at the rock cycle. The first aim is to explain the process that drives the rock cycle and then describe the processes that create the three different types of rock. Now, it has to be said that rocks get a lot of bad press from students, and that's largely because they sit there doing pretty much nothing, when in actual fact, rocks are some of the most impressive relics the Earth gives us. Rocks have been around since the dawn of the Earth. They are the ultimate eyewitnesses for change on our planet. The problem, of course, is they don't speak. But that doesn't mean they don't communicate with us. If you are a geologist, then you understand the language of rocks and the story they tell us about our Earth's formation and future. Rocks are formed from the Earth's magma, that's below ground, or lava, that's above ground. Lava is a bit like the Earth's blood leaking out. And when it cools and solidifies, it forms the rocks. But rocks are in a state of constant and slow change. So let's try and understand the story they communicate to us. So here is our blue planet, the planet Earth, and the Earth has a diameter of around 12,000 kilometers. From space, we can only see the crust of our Earth, and some of the crust is buried underneath oceans. The crust itself is fractured. It's very thin layer, only varying between five kilometers to about 50 kilometers deep, depending on whether you're standing in a valley or on top of a mountain. The fractured crust is divided into large moving masses of rock we call plates. These plates float upon the mantle. The mantle is a very slowly moving solid underneath, a bit like crackers resting on hot treacle. Now we know these plates move, and the evidence from this largely comes from earthquakes and volcanoes. Wherever earthquakes are frequent, you can expect you live somewhere on a plate boundary. This also explains why certain regions, you don't really get many earthquakes. For example, on our country in the UK, we really don't get earthquakes. Or none to worry about anyway. So earthquakes and volcanoes are found on plate boundaries. But for us to understand that the Earth is not a static system, it's always in a state of change, we need to look inside the Earth. So we need to take a cross-section through the Earth. Once we do that, we can see that the Earth is made from distinct layers. The innermost layer is referred to as the inner core. Due to the extreme pressure it's under, it acts like a solid. And just outside that, we have the outer core, which is under less pressure, so it acts more like a liquid. The inner core and outer core are made from iron and nickel, two magnetic metals, which is why our Earth has a magnetic field around it. Then, most of the Earth's structure is composed of the mantle. The mantle acts like a very slowly moving solid. The heat from the mantle is generated through the process of radioactive decay as unstable elements decompose under the Earth's crust. The thin outer layer is known as the crust. This is where we live. But as I said, the Earth's crust is fractured. It's split up, divided into giant moving plates. And these plates, as I said, can move. But what causes them to move? We get rotating currents of heat known as convection currents, which move the masses of rock that rest upon the mantle. These convection currents are responsible for moving the plates and driving the rock cycle. And knowing that convection currents drive the rock cycle will really help you in exams because it comes up a lot. So just a quick summary of the key facts. The crust is 5 to 50 kilometers deep and it's the outer layer of the Earth. The mantle acts as a slowly moving solid. Radioactive decay keeps it hot. There are convection currents in the mantle that move the plates. The core is hottest. The outer part is referred to as liquid and the inner a solid. The core is iron and nickel which makes it magnetic and therefore gives the Earth a magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful solar radiation. You may have heard of a phenomenon known as the Northern Lights. This is when solar radiation is basically interacting where the field lines are weakest at the North and South Pole. This means the radiation can enter closer to our Earth's surface. When this happens, we see this fantastic display of changing colour. But you have to be pretty far north to see this display commonly referred to as the Northern Lights, but also known as the Aurora Borealis. So now that you can explain that convection currents are responsible for plate movement, you can explain the process that drives the rock cycle. Well, I said that convection currents drive the rock cycle. 
they can cause collisions between the plates. There are two types of plates. One is continental, which is thicker and less dense, and oceanic, which is thinner and more dense. You won't need to know this for this exam, but it'll help you understand the rock cycle a bit better. So if a continental and oceanic plate are forced together, the oceanic being more dense will basically go under the continental and due to the heat and pressure will start to melt. This can lead to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Two continental plates together will basically buckle up and this will create mountains or fold mountains. So once again, remember that convection currents drive the rock cycle. So before I explain the rock cycle, let me just give you a bit of an introduction to the three different types of rocks. The first one, is igneous rock. Think of the word ignite for fire, so they're fire rocks, they're forged from magma. A common example often used for kitchen work surfaces is the very hard rock granite. Igneous rocks are very hard, very dense with interlocking grains. They also contain crystals. There are two types of igneous rock you need to know. Extrusive rocks, these basically form on the surface, let's say uh, a volcanic eruption causes lava to flow down and cool very quickly. Because they cool quickly, they have very small crystals because the crystals don't have enough time to grow. Intrusive rock forms deeper underground where it's hotter. As a result, they cool slowly and have time to develop larger crystals. This does come up in exams, so remember the difference between the two rocks. Granite is an example of an intrusive rock, whereas basalt is an example of an extrusive igneous rock. Now let's look at sedimentary rock. The most important sedimentary rock you need to know is limestone. Sedimentary rocks are basically soft and crumbly and porous. They contain little holes. This makes it easy for rainwater to percolate through and also makes them very susceptible to erosion, so they wear away very easily. You can often see uh, gravestones, which are basically the lettering's hard to read because they've been eroded over time. They're made from limestone. Now, because of the way sedimentary rock forms, they can contain fossils because the tiny bits of rock particles, sediment, can trap um, living things and preserve them over time. Another key property of uh, sedimentary rock is they formed in layers. So you can see distinct layers here. Now let's look at the final rock group, and we have metamorphic rock. The example you should know is marble. Marble is a metamorphic version of limestone. So metamorphic rock is what you get when you change either igneous or sedimentary rock due to the action of heat and pressure. The word morph itself means to change. So because other types of rock, such as limestone or granite or whatever, is compressed under heat and pressure and baked slowly over time, basically all the grains sort of line up in a regular pattern. This is one property of metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock can also contain crystals because it's, it can be formed from igneous rock and it can also contain fossils if it's formed from sedimentary rock. So remember, their grains have a regular arrangement. This little picture demonstrates how metamorphic rock can form. So imagine this was all limestone, but due to the action of heat and pressure, not hot enough to actually melt it, but just bake it over time, it becomes a different rock. So this limestone has now become marble where it's nearer the mantle. This situation also arises in exams quite commonly. But this is a cycle. That means that these are in a state of ever change. So what are the processes that are responsible for this change? To model this, I'm going to use chocolate. So igneous rock forms when basically rock completely melts, then rises and cools. This is why it will never contain fossils, because any fossil will be destroyed in the melting process. So here you can see melted chocolate, and I'm basically taking it out and putting it on a cold plate where it's going to cool rapidly. So you can see it's starting to solidify, and there you've got your igneous rock. Look how dense the chocolate is here. There are no air gaps at all. So this models igneous rock formation quite well. So now let's look at sedimentary rock and the processes involved in sedimentary rock are a little bit longer and require a little bit more attention. Sedimentary rock occurs when weathering and erosion basically acts on rocks creating debris or tiny rock particles called sediment. This sediment is then transported to local uh, water systems, rivers, oceans and so on, where the river deposits them on the seabed. Over time they build up and increase the pressure acting on lower layers and compact the layers together. This squeezes the water out of the layers. 
Then the natural minerals in water glue the rock layer together to bind it. So let's have a look. Here I'm basically grating chocolate. This is the action of weathering and erosion to create sediment. Then the sediment's transported in water to the seabed where basically more sediment is deposited and creates a pressure. Then I'm pressing it down. I'm doing this to speed up the process. And there you can see a crumbly layer of porous rock. Nowhere near as dense as igneous rock due to all the small air gaps. So now let's look at metamorphic rock. Metamorphic rock is formed through the action of heat and pressure on any of the other two rock types. It's important to know that the heat and pressure must be enough to bake the rock but not enough to melt it completely because otherwise you'll end up with igneous rock again. So let's have a look. Here the heat and pressure from my hand is slowly partially melting the chocolate. So you can see the grains of the chocolate have been compressed together. So the chalk cycle is a pretty good way of um, representing the rock cycle. So we have igneous here, the densest rock formed from melting and cooling. Then we have sedimentary rock, which is formed from weathering, erosion, deposition, compaction and cementation. But the effect of that is much crumblier, porous rock. And then we have metamorphic rock, which is somewhere in between because of the action of heat and pressure. All the rock grains get compressed and form regular layers. So remember, it doesn't matter what rock you're trying to make, the process will always be the same. Igneous rock will always be melting and cooling, doesn't matter what rock you start off with. Sedimentary rock will always be erosion, transportation, deposition, compaction and cementation, it doesn't matter what you start off with. And metamorphic rock will always be the action of heat and pressure on the other two rock groups, it doesn't matter what you start off with. And now you can describe the processes that create the three types of rock.